How did you first get started becoming an arts advocate? Well, I had always been an artist. I always, in my part-time life, would make murals for people or do art with children. And then my husband was diagnosed with cancer. And we fell into this care system that was incredibly dysfunctional. We couldn't get to data. He was injured while hospitalized. Everything that could go wrong was going wrong. And we tried to think of what can we do to save others from the things we saw happening to my husband, Fred. And I prayed about it, and my husband and I talked about it, and we decided art. Art was the way to go. So I started painting really large murals in Washington, D.C., trying to depict what was going on in the medical system. What sort of things did you paint? Well, I started initially, I, got, I couldn't get to my husband's medical record in a timely fashion. So I would requested it multiple times, went down to medical records. They said it would be 73 cents per page in a 21-day wait. Well, fortunately, another hospital used me as a courier to pick up a copy. And once I was used as a courier, I got a copy of it and I read it. And it was full of important information that I never could see. So the first mural was based on my husband's medical record and the nutrition facts label. See, I wanted a face sheet in the medical record that was that clear. I want the vitals, everything that this patient's struggling with, written very clearly, color-coded, with a visual graphic depicting where we need to be very concerned. And so I painted this mural that had all that information, and then I had to try to find a venue that would post it, right? So a local delicatessen down the street from where I live said they'd do it, and they placed it next to the menu. And I was like, really, you're going to do this? Because, <laughs> well, it's, it's unusual, and it's in-stage cancer next to a menu. Right. So not a lot of places would actually do that, I don't think, but they did. They were very brave. They understood what you were trying to they do. They totally understood. So that was the first mural. And then the weeks passed, and a local gas station had a huge wall. It's like 20 by 50 feet. And I asked them if I could have the wall to do a really large painting about our entire care journey, and they said yes. And that's how I got to paint the painting 73 cents. And, and what is in that painting? Oh my, it's covering a lot of bases, but uh, a lot of imagery that depicts technology not being used correctly, closed data loops, inability to get to medical records, visitors being too far from patients, family members not being part of the care triangle, communication between nurses and doctors being off. In the entire painting, there's 17 people and nobody's making eye contact because that's a lot of what I was seeing in the system and that was our personal story but I, I painted this during the summer of 2009 during the healthcare reform debates so other elements of the painting also address the national story of what was going on at that time so I have a see no evil hear no evil speak no evil element and that was representative of insurance small business and pharmaceuticals and those all done in a triptych where you can look at those different players in the field. And I even cover media within it. Oh, wow. Yeah. What role was that? Well, I have a giant film reel inside the painting itself, and the film is reeling off into the space because this is a painting of one person's life, mm -hmm. and it's a short reel. Mm -hmm. And then the entire painting itself is on a stage. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that our story became part of the national stage. Yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. And going back to the thought of patients getting access to their medical records, so being a medical student myself, you know, even I find medical records very hard to interpret. I don't know where to find information sometimes, and I can only imagine how hard it is for patients. Can you talk a little bit about what you were trying to find within the medical record when you embarked on that quest? Oh, sure. Um, well, for instance, if you have a copy of the medical record, whether it be electronic or paper, you have the actual spelled word, which makes it much easier to Google research it. Because without that, when we hear a doctor say these words to us we've never heard, we have no idea even how they're spelled. So you're writing them down really fast in a journal trying to understand, and you don't recall very well. Also, our auditory processing is off. We're not very good at it, especially if you're telling us something stressful. So if you give us the written document, we then have the chance in our leisure to interpret and understand that document at least enough to ask you the correct questions. Because what I see happen a lot within the system is that vital doctor-patient time is wasted. Because the patient comes in, and the caregiver, into the situation with not enough base knowledge to ask intelligent questions and to understand what you're trying to say. So if you give them that access, then they do have a potential to understand. Now the other thing is, we make assumptions that 
patients won't necessarily understand some things. Like I read my husband's imaging results, which a lot of people say, all oh, patients, they shouldn't have to read imaging results, that's too hard. I'm like, you know, there's really important stuff written within the imaging results. One of the things that happened with poor Fred was that he needed a catheter placed. Every imaging result said patient has, um, is retaining urine, has distended bladder. Well, you know what? Nobody was paying attention to that part. So he went for 14 days, got a bladder infection, and nobody placed catheter. Because the, the radiologist, you know, doing the interpretation, and the oncologist reading the film, they're not focusing on the bladder. They're focusing on the spread of the cancer. So things fall through the cracks. And this is where the patient and caregiver become incredibly important. There is no one who cares more about that particular case than they do. And if you let them be part of the team, they're going to play a vital role. Right, yeah, and a lot of Medicine X is focusing on the role that the patient and their families can play. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit more about these potential roles? Well, what's so beautiful, what's happening right now is there's this entire movement called the e-patient movement. And I just got back from doing a summit called Partnership with Patients, where we're truly talking about real partnership. Patients playing an active role with their own skill set. See, in the past, patients got invited to things. Maybe they'd be a motivational speaker or an inspirational speaker, but they weren't expected to stay the whole conference, ask tons of questions, and be part of the design phase. That's a new thing. The other thing is patients bring a new world view to this entire situation, so their solutions tend to be completely different than people who have a more institutional mindset. So if you work at Lowe's, I want to hear, as a person who works at Lowe's or Home Depot, what you do to fix medicine. It may be that you've noticed that that sink kit at that sink is not a good choice for a hospital. The sink's too short. It doesn't let you get the trays underneath. That's the kind of thing a person who works in a hardware store would see. But it's not necessarily what a doctor would see, right? Yeah. So let us speak. Let us share. And if you're an artist, let us paint. Mm -hmm. Everyone has something to contribute in the field right. of medicine, and that is so important. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you could actually um, define what an e-patient is for us. Well, e-patient's got a multiple definitions, but empowered, engaged. You know, you're somebody who has tends to study your medical condition, and you want to do something about it. You want to be part of the team. So with your art, how do you think you're reaching people in different ways? Well, I started with murals, and then I started painting canvases at conferences, but it didn't stop there. I started this movement called the Walking Gallery, where I paint the patient's story, the person who's walking around in a jacket, their story on their back. And so then when they go to medical conferences wearing a nice blazer, you know, the uniform of the conference, their story's literally on their back. And they walk in the space, and all of a sudden people start going, this is odd, this is different, and they start asking them questions. And then the person has to own their story, because you will tell your story like 40 times in one day and then you become centered through that. It becomes the entire prism that you say everything at the entire conference through. And it's amazing. So what it does is, of course we have members of the walking gallery that are patients. They self-define as patient or e-patient. But we have tons of people who are CMIOs, they work for companies, they're doctors, they're nurses, and they are telling their story. And it's just incredibly powerful. And it just changes. Like it stops being about statistics and starts being about life. And about the patients' lives and their families, and I understand you're wearing one of those. I today. am. I'm wearing my son's one. Um, he, uh, my son, he, when he wore this one, he was 13, and he every every person who does a jacket, like wears a jacket, they talk to the artist who's doing it about. Cause I, there's me and 14 other artists, okay? okay, and they explain what they want to say. So what my son wanted to do, he hears me talk about the IOM report a lot. I don't know if you're familiar no, with the Air is Human. Um, there was this report that came out in 1998 that basically said 98,000 people are dying due to medical error. And it was a really powerful report. And people use it. They reference it a lot within the medical harm community. Well, my son watched a Japanese anime show called Death Note. I don't know oh, if you've ever seen I have, that. I okay? have heard of that. Okay. Yeah. So he was like, Mom, I have this great idea. You know what Death Note, where if you write your name down in the Death Note, you die? So I want the IOM report to be the Death Note. And I want to tie these two worlds together. So I'm like, oh, I totally can do that. So I took the characters from Death Note and pulled in the world of medicine. Oh, wow. That is so creative. Yeah. That was your son and your part. Well, it was really fun to do it. It was his idea. And when I go to trade shows where we have a large segment of the population who watches Japanese anime, it's so exciting. Because they're like, oh. They recognize <laughs> they the recognize, characters. And they recognize the reference. Mm -hmm. 
of what I'm trying to say. So that we, you know, people are getting killed every day because of things we can fix. People don't have to die from medical error. We, that's a systems problem and we can fix systems. Mm -hmm. So. And what has been the general response to the walking mural? The walking gallery has been incredibly popular. So it's getting bigger and bigger. I just last night finished um, the 198th jacket in the walking gallery. Wow. And we've only been in existence for a little over a year. So it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We have walkers in Australia, Greece, France, Canada, as well as the United States. And there'll be many people at this conference joining. And they'll be here with their jackets? Yes, their there'll stories. be people coming already wearing jackets. There will be people, I will be painting on site at this venue. So there'll be people literally handing me jackets and telling me their story on site. I'll be painting their story on site. And I also understand you're painting the other conference than jackets. Itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little so, about that? So I also paint at conferences because I'll basically bring out a canvas, set up an easel, and start to paint the content that I'm hearing. So there's no preconceived idea of what the painting will be up until the point you start speaking. Once I start hearing content, then I start figuring out what I'm supposed to paint. And it'll be a painting based on the patient view. Since I'm a patient and caregiver, it's my view of what I heard you say in a conference setting. It's really powerful. How did you first get the idea to use art specifically as a way of advocacy? Well. I have a little bit of an arts background and a little bit of a theater background and a tiny little bit of studying of journalism in high school. And if you want to get your story covered, you need a hook, mm -hmm. right? Definitely. Right? Yeah. So having a widow paint a gigantic mural in Washington, D.C. just days after her husband died, that's a big hook, right? And that gets people interested enough to hear what you're trying to say. And what I'm trying to say is data access and medical error. And I got to tell you, not a lot of people want to recover cover those topics, right? So if I can get enough interest through an amazing visual medium like art, then I'm going to get people talking nationwide about these twin problems. Because why do we have medical error? A lot of times it's due to lack of data access. We get both of these problems solved, we're going to save lives. And have there been any advances in these two areas? Oh, since? yes. I testify for meaningful use. Are you familiar with high-tech legislation and meaningful use? It's amazing. Okay, ERA, you're familiar with the act that funded the stimulus funding? Yes. Okay, so, so basically there was this another act within that called HITECH. Now HITECH had this really cool thing and it called meaningful use. And in the original proposed rule, there was like a sentence about patient participation. Now meaningful use originally, they talked about you're a clinician, they're a clinician. The clinicians should be able to talk to each other electronically. Mm -hmm. You should be able to share data in a secure fashion online with another doctor. Amazing, right? They were not even talking about patients seeing it. But me and e-patient Dave and some other people, we all testified before a subcommittee and said it's really important that the patient be part of this as well. So when the proposed rule for stage one meaningful use came out, it had patients should be able to get your medical record within four days of request in the form in which they request, which can be electronic. And that is a game changer. So now we just passed stage two meaningful use and they want even more. At this point, they want 5% of all facilities and doctors who are taking meaningful use money to make sure the patients have access to a portal. Now that's a little different. Electronic, you know, giving somebody on a stick, that fulfills electronic request, right? Right. A portal, well, that's mm -hmm. totally different. That's like, oh, it's so exciting. Almost like a secure Facebook where I can communicate with my physician. I've got a portal. I've got an interface. Now I can email securely. Now I can see my labs. I can see my vitals. I can see my discharge summaries. And I also can see my year-to-year -year growth. Mm -hmm. So like some systems like Kaiser, they've already been doing this for a number of years. Right. But we're talking about making this national. Small providers as well as large providers. And because of the growth in technology, we now have cloud-based providers that can take a small, small clinic. Maybe it's only got like 100 beds they can have the same kind of cool ability to communicate that a large, large chain of facilities can have. Wow, that's amazing. It is amazing. And to know that your advocacy, you know, helped. Yes. Helped with all these advances. Oh, yes. And now we've got something great. even cooler called Blue Button. I don't know if you follow that. Okay, Blue Button came out a few years ago through the VA, which was the idea that there's a computer screen and there's a blue button. You just push the blue button. Everything they've got for a year in the VA system goes into your home computer as a download. Wow. Yeah, isn't that cool? So then it spread out to TRICARE and Medicare. And then there was this White House summit in June that I was at. And at the summit, what they decided was 
other people could become part of this. So anybody who wanted to could raise their hand and say, we want to do Blue Button. So Epic, which is mm -hmm. the big vendor that works with Kaiser, right. they said they wanted to do it. United Healthcare said they wanted to do it. There was all these people who said, we want to make this happen. Right. Now, why is this important? Because of iPhones and third party developers, right? So if you get a data dump of all that raw data, right? You said it's hard to read. Right. Oh, yeah, even well. For medical yes, right? Okay. So there's these amazing companies that what they do is they crunch that stuff and they compile it and they pull out keywords and then you can get to the stuff you really need fast. And we've never applied this to medicine before. And that was actually one of my questions that I was thinking about. You know, you get all this data, but then who's going to help the patients interpret it? Is right. it going to be the physicians? Is it going to be, you know, who who well, I think that, that role? Many. So, so if you get a, just a dump, the, like a blue button dump, for instance, is an ASCII file. So it's 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 challenging. You got to figure out. Have you ever read HTML coding or any of that? Like, I have actually. Okay, okay so you know, <laughs> so you you can read it. It's just buried in there, right? <laughs> so so what? That's a straight dump. Now a doctor, when when they read it, it they can just see that they're used to the form, right? Right. Okay. So so you hand it to your doctor. They're like, Oh yes, this is what I needed to know because you have a problem with one kind of drug. You shouldn't take that at the same time as this drug. We needed this information. Yay! Game changer. Okay? But what a company can do, now it's a free data set, right? I've downloaded, I can send to you, your third party vendor that I've released the information to because I want to, right? Then they can crunch it in a new way and make it in plain language. They can make it the way you need it to be. Hmm. So, so it can be a wonderful addition to what the provider can give you. Right, so it's the patients kind of taking ownership and learning more through their medical records so that when they do go into clinic, they know the right questions to ask, they have all the information already, so they can have an educated conversation with their physician. Correct. That's great. Isn't it? Yeah. We're in a brave new world, so I'm glad to be part of it.